I was reading um, about an old news story recently that reminded me of the passage that we've arrived at in this series of services that's brought us to the third chapter of the book of Genesis, which we've just heard read. This is, as James was saying a moment ago, it's the uh, chapter where things begin to go wrong. More of that in a moment. But the news story was back in 1963 when I was barely a nipper. Uh, when government minister John Profumo was caught in that massive sex scandal that many of you will remember, and he was forced to resign his post. Interestingly, he spent much of the re remainder of his life seeking to make amends by devoting his life to charitable works. When he eventually died some 14 years ago, the obituary writers were actually quite kind to him. But rarely, I think, can one man's life be said to have taken a more dramatic turnaround as the result of one episode of folly. Apart, maybe, from Adam. Now, this may be an oversimplistic summary, but how would it be, I wonder, to describe the Bible as the world being created in three pages, by God, being messed up in one page, by Adam, and then another thousand pages and putting the mess right. Well, we're not going to be looking at the thousand pages, but we are going to be looking at the one page today, which is Genesis chapter three. And we've heard how the perfect creation that God had made as uh, an expression of his self-giving imagination, how it was all ruined by the activity of two of his creatures, precisely those creatures that he'd favoured by creating them in his own image. And today we'll see how it all happened. And we're going to do that first by thinking about the, na the nature of the temptation itself, and then by thinking about the results of Adam and Eve giving in to that temptation. So firstly, then the nature of the temptation. According to Genesis chapter three, we're told the temptation to sin came from the serpent. We don't know anything about that serpent. We have ideas, obviously, but it's not clear at all. That serpent asks Eve, did God really say? Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Clever stuff, sneaky stuff, but actually a total misrepresentation, misrepresentation of what God had said, which was, check in verse 16, you are free. You are free to eat from any tree. You are free to eat from any tree. It's a totally different emphasis, in other words. Before there's mention of any prohibition, God gives more or less total freedom. But the serpent takes that positive invitation, the invitation to eat it of any tree, and turns it into a negative prohibition, as if God somehow begrudged Eve all those lovely, luscious fruits of Eden. The voice of temptation brings about the same thing today very often, um, as we limit God's loving generosity. And um, that limitation has us major on what we're not supposed to do. And the effect, the effect is really to falsify our Father God to us, making him out to be strict and miserly, which is precisely why so many people picture our loving Heavenly Father as actually just an old man with a stick, ready to lash out as soon as we step out of line. This is the God who says, you are free, free to eat from any tree. Another line that the tempter takes, I think, is to begin with suggestion rather than flat out contradictions. It's as if he's saying, oh, come now, it doesn't really matter. Only a small little thing. Now, that's not an out and out attack on the wrongness of theft or adultery or murder or whatever. But, you know, just a casual glance in the wrong direction. We might see it in terms of not being quite upfront with that expenses claim, or maybe a snide, gossipy comment about a neighbour. That's very often where sin begins, doesn't it? 
with the small, the petty, the things that no one in their right mind would worry about. Bit by bit, though, the serpent's questions become very obvious lies, lies that pile up. He moves from questioning God's words to contradicting them. And eventually, in verse five, shunts God out of the way, offering Eve the chance actually to take God's place. Eat the fruit and you'll be like God. You'll get the secret knowledge by outwitting God. What an intoxicating idea. But the result for all humanity is that we, in the likeness of Adam and Eve, come to see God, consciously or not, as our rival and our enemy. Rather than trusting the, crea the creator, our focus tends to be all my rights, my power, my, my self-determination. Thankfully, though, God's loving purposes are much bigger than demonic serpent-like schemes, much greater than human doubts or arrogance. Because when in the Gospels Jesus steps in, he expresses God's powerful movement towards humanity, demonstrating that God has never ceased wanting to walk with us as he walked at first with Adam and Eve in the garden. Jesus comes and he counteracts our big human no to God, our refusal to honour him, to bring him the worship he alone deserves. Jesus counteracts our no to God and he also demonstrates God's no to sin by dying for our sins on the cross as one of us. And crucially, Christ actually reverses our no to God simply because his life was one long yes to God, a life of utter obedience. So sin enters the world. Adam and Eve take the fruit, they eat it, their eyes are open, but all they see is their guilt and shame in verses 7 and 10. Before they sinned, we read, they walked freely with God in the garden, they talked freely, they related openly. And their nakedness was just a symbol of their total lack of inhibitions with each other. Yes, certainly. And with God, the lack of barriers with their creator. Once they sin, though, they become aware of their acute vulnerability and they feel that vulnerability as shame. Their identity as free children of their creator uh, with, uh, uh, sorry, their identity of as free children of their creator God has been uh, forever spoiled. They feel distant, they feel alienated from him and when he comes when he comes looking for them they do, do the only thing they can which of course is to hide. Later we read in, the, in, this, in this chapter we read those awful curses Curses which in ancient uh, traditional times would have been thought of as blights upon the man and the woman's major functions in life. Not only are Adam and Eve tormented by the bitter memory of what they've lost, but the woman in her major function as wife and mother is to suffer. And the man as breadwinning farmer will have to battle with the soil to produce his harvests because creation itself is infected by sin. And turns against them. For us perhaps the issues are broader, we don't have the same division of, of labour uh, uh, between man and woman as they did in, in traditional times. We know for example that it's not just the man-wife relationship that soured, but all relationships suffer from this curse of sin. Equally today we have the battle with drudgery and stress in our work, whether we're male or female, and wherever that work is, just as keenly as Adam did in his fields. Worst of all though, God sends Adam and Eve away out of the garden. And that scene has been the subject of many great works of art and music, writing, literature and it's captured the imagination of so many uh, artists 
because so many of us share that experience of being uh, of being exiled, of being alone in the world. It's such a tragic moment. Having spoiled the garden as descendants of those who first sinned against God's world, God's word, we, all of us, feel that we're exiled from the home that was created for us. The, con the consequence is simply too hard to bear. Except when we begin to see signs of God's grace shining through, even in these darkest moments of the story. So, for example, those fiery angels, the cherubim in verse 24, that guard the way so that Adam and Eve couldn't get back into the garden, preventing them from eating the fruit of the tree of life. It, it all sounds terrible, doesn't it? But this isn't just a punishment. The thing is, if they'd returned to Eden and eaten the fruit from the other tree that's named the tree of life, they'd have been able to live forever. But that would have been a life lived in a lost, and we might think of it as a depraved condition. Once they disobeyed God by eating the, the other, the fruit of the other tree. God had a better plan, a plan of salvation, which takes us back not merely to paradise, but it takes us forward to a home, a glorious home, a home where we truly belong. As I said earlier, it takes another thousand pages before we see that glory. But in Revelation chapter 22, finally, we see God's face appearing again. That face, which in Genesis chapter three has been hidden at the end of the very, uh, in the final chapter of the Bible. We see God's face appearing again to those who have responded to his salvation, made freely available through Jesus. There's a question uh, back earlier in Genesis 3, which is uh, tricky and disturbing, maybe, but which I think we must look at before leaving this chapter. It's a, it's a question, I think, that all those who uh, are um, God's saints in every age will have, uh, will have focused on in their lives, will have turned over and over again before daring to make an answer the question uh, is where are you god's call when he comes the second time to the garden and rather than running towards his embrace his creatures adam and eve are suddenly nowhere to be seen where are you at first sight it appears to be a condemning question the all-knowing god already knows that they've broken his one little prohibition. But I think it also comes possibly as a, a question of hope. Where are you? Do you know yourself to be distant? Do you know yourself to be lacking in the experience of open and openness and honesty with your loving creator fa father? Where are you? Because God's movement is still towards you, which is why Jesus said he came to seek and save that which was lost. The thing is not to pretend you're in control when you're not. Where are you? Just answer God simply that you will listen, that you will hear, that you will do what he tells you. I mentioned those cherubim in verse 24, guarding the way back to Eden. Don't think of the little cherubs in the in the Renaissance paintings. Uh, I describe them as fiery angels. They don't really know what the Hebrew word means, but it's probably something quite uh, quite scary. Elsewhere in the Bible, these strange angelic figures are seen as uh, symbolic guardians of the holiest place within the temple in the Old Testament. Um, their forms were embroidered in that thick veil that bar barred access to the, holiest, uh, the Holy of Holies in the temple. And at the moment of Jesus' death, that veil with its cherubim was ripped apart. 
and the way to God was thrown open. Where are you? Wherever you feel yourself to be this All Saints Day, God's great salvation is now no longer impeded by the problem of sin, by the piffling problem of sin. What Jesus addresses is the question of whether we will count ourselves poor, poor in spirit, as we heard in the first of the Beatitudes, whether we will count ourselves poor enough to be rescued, because that's what his people, his saints have done in every age. That's the starting place of God's blessing in our lives. We move forward with Jesus' rescue package, with our eyes firmly fixed on him, on his sacrifice to restore us to God, to restore us firmly and finally and forever to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your great rescue pass, uh, package. Thank you, Lord, for the freedom for which you've created us. Thank you for the freedom which is restored to us in Jesus. And Lord, even in these days, when all the talk is of sorrow and of limitation and of lockdown, we pray that even today, by your Holy Spirit, you would come to us afresh and assure us not only of your presence, but of that freedom. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.